So glad to see you here on a beautiful fall day. Um, uh, there are announcements uh, printed in your bulletin and they've been scrolling up on the screen and I'm not going to go over all of them, but I do want to bring, uh, bring up two of them, please. And that is Charge Conference is October 20th. And if you're interested in going, contact either pastor when he gets back from vacation or the church office. And then we've got the pork chop chicken breast dinner coming up at the end of the month. Uh, I think there have been a lot of volunteers already uh, for that, but I know there's always room for more. <laughs> and so if you haven't volunteered, uh, Jeremy will be more than glad to find a place for you to uh, lend your helping hand. Uh, Jim Van Dyke has an announcement that he's going to share with, with us now. Good morning, church family. Uh, on behalf of the Staff Parish Relations Committee, I want to call your attention to the Pastor Appreciation Day, which is two weeks from today. And in the meantime, we are all asked to get one of these cups. They're in the back of the sanctuary, and I'm sure they're on the front desk. I didn't check. But and in the next two weeks, as it says on the brochure, decorate them and as creative as you want to be and put a message on the cup, and then fill them with anything. Candy, mints, notes, it says ties, that would be interesting. Socks, homemade items, gag gifts, money, or gift cards. And then bring these cups to Sunday, October 16, for Pastor Appreciation Sunday. And an, another note of appreciation that I neglected when I introduced Reg as our new custodian, I forgot to thank Kelly Lawson for her service as our custodian for I think about 15 months and her husband Chad, so thank, when you see Kelly and Chad, thank them for their work as our church custodian. Thank you. At this time, our acolytes will bring forth the light of Christ. If you are able, would you please stand for the call to worship and the unison prayer? Wisdom is calling. Are we listening? Wisdom is begging us to pay attention. Are we listening? Wisdom is crying out. Are we listening? God, we are listening for you. Speak to us. our time for joys and concerns 
I have a, a fairly long list of, of concerns, uh, and I'll share those first, and then if you have any, you can share them. Uh, Claudia Reed fell and is recovering at home at this, at this point. Angie Agnew's mom, uh, we still need to keep her in prayer uh, as she's battling the, the brain tumor. Uh, we're so glad that Ellen's back with us today after her fall, but I'm sure she could use a few prayers to uh, speed up her recovery. I asked her how she was doing today, and she says better, but that means she's got a little more to go. So we'll pray for Ellen. Um, we need to pray for Marilyn Markey and, and her family. Uh, I was up to St. Anthony's on Friday afternoon, and... Um, they didn't think she was going to make it through the night or yesterday, but I haven't heard anything. Uh, so uh, uh, I assume she's still in, in very precarious uh, situation right now in, in critical care. And another one we need to lift up in prayer is Rosie Schuler. This would be uh, uh, Les's mother-in-law. Uh, she, she had an in incident and is in St. Anthony's now and they're waiting for some tests to find out more in the coming days here. And so those are all people we need to, to keep in our prayers. Are there any other joys or concerns that you'd like to share at this point? They are one of the summer residents of Carroll. They still live in Arkansas. They've been in Dawson for about 18 years, but it seems like yesterday. So welcome back to you. You're always welcome. That is indeed a, a, a thrilling event to have them back. Any, anything else? Uh, Barb Heston has uh, some test uh, results that will be coming in shortly. She had a test on Friday. That is my ex-mother-in-law, Noah Michaels' grandmother. And we have a Mrs. Hill has a birthday today. Thank you, Amber. Anything else? If, if not, let's uh, be in, in prayer with God. Creator God, red, orange, yellow, green, brown, and so much more are part of your glorious colors of this autumn beauty that we see outside. We thank you for all of that and all of creation. You've given us a wonderful earth on which to live, and we really recognize the beauty of it this fall. And we thank you for not only that, but all the other wonderful things you have given us. We thank you for family, for our lives, for our friends. We thank you for all that you've given us, including this church, and we pray that you will always sustain us and help us be about your business in connecting people with God. We pray for those whom I named earlier. We pray for, for recovery. We pray for strength. We pray for hope. We pray for peace. We ask now that as we continue our worship that you will Keep us in your love and in your care and give us your grace and wisdom and courage as we pray the prayer which your son taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For that is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
Just a preface to our uh, scripture this morning. Um, Solomon, uh, one of the sons of David, has now become king. There is no temple yet. So um, he follows in the statutes of his, his father and he goes up to Gibeon, which is one of the high places, to offer sacrifices to God. And that night, he, God appears to him in a dream and says, ask what I should give you. Now, this is Solomon's response. Now, Lord my God, you have made your servant king in place of my father David, but I am only a little child and do not know how to carry out my duties. Your servant is here among the people you have chosen, 
a great people, too numerous to count or number. So give your servant a discerning heart to govern your people and to distinguish between right and wrong. For who is able to govern this great people of yours? The Lord was pleased with Solomon, that Solomon had asked for this. So God said to him, since you have asked for this and not for long life or wealth for yourself, nor have asked for the death of your enemies, but for discernment in administrating justice, I will do what you have asked. I will give you a wise and discerning heart so that there will never be anyone like you, nor will there ever be. Moreover, I will give you what you have not asked for, both wealth and honor, so that in your lifetime you will have no equal among kings. And if you walk in obedience to me and keep my decrees and commands, as David your father did, I will give you a long life. The word of God for the people of God. I, I got to tell you this. I, I enjoy sitting up here uh, when Jake is playing the piano because uh, you can't see all that I can see up here. I don't when I'm down there. But he's got an iPad here and he's playing and, and I'm waiting for him to flip his finger across the iPad to, to uh, flip the pages on it, you know, but they're flipping on their own. Well, not exactly. He's got a pedal down there that he, that he flips the uh, pages with. It's, it's pretty intriguing to watch all this. But this kind of fits in what, I, what I'm going to say. I, I like the whys and the hows of how things work. When we went to Carol's went with Carol's family on our annual vacation in northern Minnesota this year, a con conversation got started about the lakes in Minnesota. Elaine, the middle child of the five siblings, made some comment about Minnesota being the state of 10,000 lakes. She further clarified that it was probably many more than that amount, possibly even double that number. She didn't know if anybody even really knew. On our eight-hour uh, drive home from Quadna, I pondered the thought of really, how many lakes are there in Minnesota? I also speculated why Minnesota had so many. Driving through the hundreds of miles of the Gopher State, I came to the conclusion that one of the reasons for so many lakes had to be that the land is so flat that the water doesn't really drain properly. Then we crossed the Mississippi River. Yeah, I began to doubt that logic. After all, how could drainage be the reason for so many lakes when the largest river in North America has its source in Minnesota? So the lack of drainage didn't hold water, so to speak. Needless to say, once we got home, I did my research and discovered some surprising and yet not so surprising answers to my questions. First, to be accurate, there are 11,842 lakes of 10 acres or more in Minnesota. In 1968, a survey found that there were an additional 3,257 lake basins that existed but were dry. Furthermore, if you count all the lake basins that are two and a half acres or more, Minnesota would have 21,000 871 lakes. Fairly impressive, I'd say. Now, as to the reason why there are so many lakes in Minnesota, I discovered much to my surprise that it was the result of the last glacial period. However, I found some truth to my theory that there are so many lakes because the land is so flat. Much of the precipitation is retained temporarily on the surface of the lakes, the streams and rivers that connect all the lakes and drain the system from one to the next only re remove a part of the precipitation, leaving much of it remaining in the lakes. The mighty Mississippi has cut a deep valley through much of the lower part of the state, but even it doesn't flow freely enough to drain all the water to the ocean. As I contemplated these things, I wondered if any of that really mattered to Carol's family. Or rather, are they mostly just glad the lakes are there? 
and can be used for fishing, boating, tubing, and skiing? Is it really important to them how they got there? Why they are there? Or is the important thing that the lakes are beautiful and have recreational value? What is most important are the memories of all the great family times spent on the lakes. Considering the story of Solomon, I am intrigued by the many things that happen to affect the uh, outcome of his story and make him the glorious, successful king that he was. Indeed, he was a way different king than his two predecessors, Saul and David. His father, David, was a rugged warrior king. David was able to do battle quite successfully with any of his enemies. He had the courage to do battle with foes extremely much more formidable than himself or his armies. Solomon, on the other hand, was a king who was revered for his ability to discern truth, his wisdom, his poetry, his songwriting ability, and his construction and contracting skills. His long-term project that won him the most fame was building the temple. The temple was one of those unfulfilled dreams of his father, David. Wow, what a contrast between father and son, between warrior king and contractor king. If you're not one of those folks who really cares about how and why there are so many lakes in Minnesota, but just enjoy their beauty and life value, then concentrate on the wonder and beauty of Solomon's life as I, we move forward and examine some of the details that led him to become the great contractor king of the Jewish nation. As I said earlier, I'm intrigued about some of the things that happened to Solomon to get him to the point that he became David the successor to the throne and the great king that he was. First of all, should he have been the successor, successor to David? Eh, normally that position would have fallen to David's oldest son, who was Amnon. However, that didn't really matter because Amnon was murdered by a half-brother long before David died. Solomon actually was number 10 son in the list of David's sons. Three of David's sons actually died during David's lifetime, which would have meant that Solomon was probably seventh in line. There were six brothers ahead of him in succession to the throne. So why did he succeed to the throne? It seems that David's one wife, Bathsheba, negotiated the deal with David somehow. Regardless, God approved of Solomon and David appointed him king even before he died. What a remarkable event. Interestingly enough, I think it's fair to say that history proves that he was probably the best choice. Now, what did Solomon do after he became king that ended up defining his reign? He realized that he was young and definitely inexperienced. So he went to God in prayer and asked for help, as we read or heard Carol read from uh, 1 Kings 3, 7 through 15. Solomon recognized that he was young and very inexperienced, and he needed help. And he prayed to God for wisdom and discernment. God was pleased that he asked for these things rather than the more common wishes of wealth, power, and longevity. God responded by giving him what he asked for, plus I don't know if you noticed it in the scripture, but he also gave him the things he didn't request, all of which would help to propel Solomon into a totally awesome reign as king of the Hebrews. Solomon was put to the test early on when two women came to him for a ruling on which, he, which one should be allowed to keep a baby boy. It seems these two women lived together and both delivered baby boys about the same time. However, tragedy struck one night when one of the mothers rolled over and laid on her son 
smothering him to death. Once she realized what happened, she did the little switcheroo thing of the babies and took the other mother's live baby and left the dead, mother, dead baby with the sleeping mom. Upon waking the next morning, the second mother examined the dead boy laying with her and discovered he wasn't really her son. So he went to the first woman and demanded her son back. As one would expect, a fight ensued over the live baby. The two women went to Solomon for a resolution to the argument. Solomon listened to both sides and all the bickering between the two women. It apparently got quite heated and a fierce battle between the two women ensued. Hearing and seeing enough of this, Solomon ordered that a sword be brought and the baby be cut in half, with each lady receiving half of the baby. Of course, we know what happened. The real mother of the little boy could not hear or bear the thought of her son being killed, so she told Solomon to let the other woman have the baby and spare his life. Solomon knew and understood that only the real mother would give up her child to save his life. Once Solomon was certain who the real mother was, he had the baby returned to the rightful mother. Now, if you were that mother, would have you been interested in why Solomon was able to discern the truth of this situation? Or would have you just rejoiced in the beauty of the moment? If you'd been an observer of this whole episode, would have you been zeroing in on the why and how Solomon was able to make this ruling? Or would have you just marveled at his brilliant decision? What is most important why and how there got to be so many lakes in Minnesota? No, maybe that's not most important. Maybe what's most important is the lakes of beauty, recreation, and fond memories. However, remember, I'm that guy who likes the details of the hows and the whys. As I look into this story of Solomon, I'm drawn back to the fact that when Solomon became king, he prayed to God for wisdom and discernment. And without that happening first, perhaps this little baby boy would have grown up with a mother who was less than honest. Is there a lesson for us here to learn? What if we have a Solomon moment and have to make a decision that may affect the outcome of other lives? Will we be prepared to handle it? In his book, Lies We Believe About God, Paul William Young tells a story of his mother and her Solomon moment. In 1946, she entered a three-year nursing program at Royal Jubilee Hospital in Victoria, Columbia, or British Columbia, Canada. Bernice was 18, single, and wanted to eventually become a medical missionary. Three months into her training, shortly after she received her cap, a woman came into the hospital bleeding. She was the wife of Reverend Munn the senior pastor of the Angulan, 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 Angulan Church in Victoria. Medical records showed that she had already lost five babies in late second and third trimesters, and now her sixth pregnancy was in jeopardy. The doctor rushed in, examined Mrs. Munn, and concluded that the baby was going to have to be taken. He hurriedly scheduled an emergency C-section and ordered a head nurse and a student nurse to assist. The student nurse was to assist, learn, and do the cleanup. After three months of nurses training, this 18-year-old girl, Bernice, was in the midst of an emergency C-section in which the doctor delivered a one-pound baby boy. In 1946, premature babies rarely survived, especially boys. 
There was no neonatal unit or NICU. State-of-the-art technology at the time was basically chicken incubators. In other words, boxes with heat lamps. The baby was only one pound. The doctor placed the tiny newborn in a kidney tray, handed it to Bernice and said, it's not viable, dispose of it. It's not viable, dispose of it. Bernice examined the tiny baby. He was still breathing. Disposing of this child meant putting him in the incinerator where all medical waste was destroyed. She was caught in a monumental dilemma, a Solomon moment, if you will. In the service area outside the operating room, she found a washcloth. She wrapped the baby inside it and placed it in the kidney tray. She walked back into the operating room, placing the kidney tray on top of the sterilization unit, the only warm place in the room. The doctor finished the surgery and assuming everything was in order, left. The head nurse rolled Mrs. Munn to post-op for recovery, leaving Bernice to clean up. This boy was delivered at 8.30 p.m. At 9.30, Bernice had finished cleaning up and was sitting in a chair holding him, waiting for him to die. Her thought was, once he died, she would obey the doctor and no one would be the wiser. At the same time, the doctor met with the parents and informed them their son was not viable and had not survived. By 1.30 a.m., Bernice decided she better tell someone and called the head nurse who had assisted. The nurse was outraged at all the trouble they were in, but called the doctor. He rushed in from home and was furious. He ripped into this young girl who, because of her insubordination and inability to follow protocol, had put him and the whole hospital in the middle of a huge dilemma. He basically accused her of creating creating this problem and telling her it was now her responsibility to handle it. Above all, she was not to say a word to the parents. Not knowing what else to do, this young nurse in training took the baby to the nursery. She and the other nurses held him around the clock and fed him with an eyedropper. Over the next two days, he lost four ounces. What was the doctor thinking? Surely he thought that the baby would die and once that happened, the code of silence would kick in and everything would be swept under the rug. However, this determined little boy began to pick up weight. The doctor realized he had to tell the parents. He told them, that they did not want to give them any false hope when he was born, we were certain that he would not survive. But due to the miracles of modern medicine, we have managed to keep him alive. Although chances are still, almost none that he will make it. And even if he does, there's certain to be complications like brain damage and other physical damages. The parents didn't care at that moment. They had a son whom they named Harold, meaning good news. Later that day, Reverend Munn baptized his son with an eyedropper. No one expected him to live. However, two weeks later, Mrs. Munn went home, and two months later, Harold went home. Two years later, the nurses including Bernice, received an invitation to Harold's second birthday party. She went, mostly out of curiosity, and what she found was a little boy running and playing with the other children and looking pretty normal. Well, maybe a little skinny. 
Bernice said nothing to the parents about how and why Harold had survived. She graduated from nurses training, went to Bible college, and ended up being a missionary in the wilds of New Guinea. Years later, she and her family moved back to Canada. One day, she happened across an Ang Anglican newsletter with an obituary of Bishop Munn. Curious, she asked an Anglican nurse if she knew the bishop. It turned out she knew him well and had worked with him with First Nations people. Still uncertain, she asked the Anglican nurse if he ever had any children. The answer was one. A remarkable boy, Harold, who was a missionary teacher in West Africa. Bernice said nothing of this for another 10 years, and only then because she happened to cross another obituary. This one was the doctor who had given her such grief. It was only then that she told her family about Harold Munn. She became determined to track him down, to tell him the truth about his birth. She did find him, now the pastor of the Ang Anglican church just down the street where his father had pastored in 1946. She fretted for another six months trying to figure out how to tell him without him thinking she was trying to take credit. Finally, she wrote a letter at Christmas wrapping his story inside another story of the coming of a son. Harold responded. They soon met and became close friends. Now, as Paul Harvey used to say, here's the rest of the story. Bernice and her own son were at odds with each other. She shared her difficulty with her own son in a conversation with Harold. He ends up helping her and her son reclaim their relationship. She saved a one pound baby in 1946, and decades later, that baby, now a grown man, Harold, built a bridge that she could walk across to restore her relationship with her own son. Just like Solomon making a gutsy decision to call for a sword to divide the baby between two quarreling women, Bernice went against orders, against conventional prevailing protocol. She and others went beyond the call of duty to save a life. Just like Solomon, Bernice had been praying for God's help in becoming a medical missionary. She now encountered a detour along that road that God helped, with God's help, she was able to help save the life of a baby. Bernice's Solomon moment came at a very unexpected time. I'm certain that she was totally shocked how this could happen to her. However, I'm convinced that she was prepared for the moment and was guided in her decision by the hand of God. She'd already been paying, praying for God's guidance and wisdom in pursuit of becoming a medical missionary. She was ready, prepared to make a life-changing de decision. Are you ready for your Solomon moment? Are you praying for God's wisdom and discernment in your life? In his book, America, A Redemption Story, Tim Scott, a black senator from South Carolina, talks about what happened on June 17, 2015. A man was welcomed into Mother Emanuel African Methodist Episcopal Church and loved by its members. He was invited to join them in reading the Bible, praying and encouraging one another. Then he retrieved a weapon with a singular goal of extinguishing those shining lights. He murder, murdered nine members of Mother Emanuel AME Church, including their pastor, a close longtime friend of Tim Scott. Tim shares that about a week or so after the massacre, he was preparing to deliver a speech to the U.S. Senate. He felt the need to make a phone call. He had reached out to the families of, nine, of the nine slain saints, but had not yet spoken to all of them. 
He picked up his phone and dialed Daniel Simmons Jr. Tim explained the purpose of his call. He wanted to voice Daniel's feelings to the entire Senate. After a long silence, Daniel Simmons told Tim, remind them of Romans 8, 28. And we know that in all things, God works together for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. Daniel continued, I don't know how, but I'm certain that we can count on the fact that God is going to use what happened in an amazing way. Tim, excuse me, Tim continues in the aftermath of the mass murder, all of Charleston had held its breath. The state of South Carolina had held its breath. Would there be riots? Would there be violence and looting? The wound was deep, the pain and anger acute. Just two days later, a representative of each one of the Emanuel Nine was given opportunity to address the shooter directly. All of America watched with bated breath as one by one, each family not only forgave the murderer, but also spoke words of grace and love. The survivors told the killer about the love of Jesus and how redemption was available even to him. Each was clearly broken. Each wept as they spoke. But rather than saying words of anger or hatred, they spoke the language of purest love. These men and women were concerned for the heart and soul of the man who had just murdered their pastor and their loved ones in cold blood. Wow, what a Solomon moment that was. These faithful Christians respond, responded in an atrocity with the love that only God could have instilled within them. What a life-changing moment for those folks for Charleston, for America. Are you ready for your Solomon moment? When you might be asked to voice your opinion or act in a life-changing situation? It might be a great idea to be praying now Solomon's prayer. So give your servant a discerning heart to share with your people, to distinguish between right and wrong, I'm confident if you pray that prayer, God will make sure you are ready for your Solomon moment. Pray for God's wisdom and courage, and he will give it to you so that you will be prepared to handle whatever moment is put in front of you. Our worship has ended. Go now in peace and serve the Lord. Amen.